You're listening to episode 48 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. This is a special bonus episode that we recorded to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. And so we gave them early exclusive access to this show after soliciting questions from them to ask Jimmy. And now we're going to share it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. They got early access a little while ago, and now you're getting to listen to it and to enjoy that and see if this is one of those perks that will help you decide to become a patron. So we hope you enjoy this show. Welcome to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, which is made possible by you, our patrons on Patreon. We're always looking for ways to thank you for your generosity in making all our shows on StarQuest possible, and this is just one of those ways we've come up with. And we recently reached out to you and asked if you had questions you'd like to ask Jimmy, and we got so many great responses. And so that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So Jimmy, how are we going to be handling the questions today? Well, we're going to answer them in the order received. So first come, first served. Uh, We want to thank as many people as possible by answering their questions. And so a few people asked more than one question, and we'll answer those second questions that people asked after we go through the others. And that way, the most people possible get to ask questions in the time we have today. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Obviously, the answers are going to have to be brief. But the good news is we'll be devoting full episodes to some of the mysteries we're going to be talking about that our patrons have asked. So, Jimmy, our first question comes from a patron, Michael L., and he says, what about the Epsilon Booties space probe hypothesis for the radio echoes discovered in the 1920s? So what's this all about? Well, uh, back in the 1920s, uh, some guys working with radio detected what appeared to be time-delayed echoes of broadcasts originating here on Earth. And they were time-delayed enough that they couldn't come from an earthly transmitter. Uh, They would have arrived sooner than they actually did. So the idea is someone, you know, says something on the radio somewhere, and then three seconds later, we hear an echo of that same person saying the same thing. And that would mean, um, presumably, that the signal traveled at light speed from the transmitter for one and a half seconds and then hit something and bounced back for one and a half seconds. And that's why it's delayed by three seconds. So these are called long delayed uh, radio echoes. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes if you want to uh, learn more about that. But one of the proposals that has been made is that this could be what's known as a Bracewell probe reflecting these things back at us in an attempt to make contact. What a Bracewell probe is, it's a hypothetical device that has been speculated that civilizations might want to use to communicate with each other over interstellar distances. Uh, It's really hard to hold a phone conversation at interstellar distances because you say a sentence and then you're going to have to wait multiple years for the reply to come back because of the light speed limit on radio communications. So the idea is instead of uh, doing that, what you do is you program a probe, presumably with an AI that's capable of interacting with people in a way that represents you fairly and you send that probe to the civilization you want to talk to, or even just randomly hoping it finds a civilization. And then when it gets close, it the people there can talk to your probe that kind of serves as your ambassador to them. And that way you can hold a conversation in real time or much closer to real time without the long interstellar delays. And so when we found these radio echoes, there was a question, well, what's causing them? In the 1970s, it was proposed, well, maybe a Bracewell probe is out there, maybe in one of our Lagrange points, and it's reflecting these communications back at us to try to make contact with us. And so uh, we, um, Michael L. sent us a, a, a link to an article uh, by the guy who proposed that, or one of the guys who proposed it, so that'll be in the show notes too. 
in terms of what I think about it, I think it's a I think it's fascinating. I've been aware of long delay echoes for some time and have uh, thought about doing an episode on the show on them. I should point out there are conventional or more conventional explanations for what these things are besides a Bracewell probe. Um, it, for example, reflections off the moon, although the author of the article says that's that's not what's happening in this case. Also, reflections off the ionosphere. Uh, the idea is a signal would go up and bounce around between the Earth's ionosphere and magnetosphere, and that w- that's what's causing the delay before you hear the echo. And there are other possibilities as well, including hoax. But uh, there are a number of possibilities here. It's an interesting idea. By the way, if you ever watched Babylon 5, there was an episode called in, uh, A Day in the Strife in which the uh, station encounters what appears to be a Bracewell probe that says, if you answer the following questions to prove your worthiness, we'll give you all this information because you'll have proved you're ready to handle it. And before they transmit the final answer, Captain Sheridan gets suspicious. And so the probe starts to fly off. Then they transmit the answer and the probe explodes. Um, and so revealing it wasn't just an ordinary Bracewell probe. It was known. It's what's known as a berserker that's designed to seek out civilizations that could be a threat and eliminate them. Are they technologically advanced enough to be a, a threat? So if you ever encounter a Bracewell probe, Trust but verify. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll keep that in mind. It's interesting. And so we're possibly going to go in more depth on this later? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Because now you've got my interest peak. <laughs> All right. So our next question comes from Lindsay S. Lindsay says, great idea, Jimmy. I'm not sure if this one has an answer, but can you discuss the mystery of how the ancient Egyptian pyramids were built? For example, how were the large stones moved and lifted onto each other during their pyramids construction? What kind of engineering knowledge did they have that they could conceive these kinds of buildings? Well, in terms of the conception, how they conceived them, we know the answer to that. By the way, you want to listen to episode six of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we talk about the pyramids and how they were built. We know how they got the idea. It's based on the original style of Egyptian tomb after they after they just stopped burying people in pits, which wasn't a great solution because you'd have animal predation, they would protect the bodies of the deceased by putting on them, putting over them a kind of rectangular memorial stone known as a mastaba. Uh, Mastaba is an Arabic word. It means bench. And that's what they kind of look like. They look like kind of a big shoebox. And eventually the uh, architect's You know, they get more sophisticated and clever over time. They want to do new things. And so what they then did was say, hey, let's put another smaller mastaba on top of the foundational mastaba. And then let's make a series of progressively smaller mastabas, like a wedding cake. Well, that guy's mastaba is taller than mine. I want mine to be a little (laughs) taller than his. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so so that's how the pyramid structure developed. In And they figured this out in the Old Kingdom. That's when the Giza pyramids were built. I mean, King Tut, who we've talked about in Akhenaten, they're, you know, like 1,700 years after all this. So this is very early they figured this out. And we can see the progression of how they got progressively better at building pyramids. In terms of the really big ones at Giza, there is this question of how do they get the blocks up to the top? Well, one of the things that people have suggested is maybe they just build a big ramp. The problem is, in order to build a ramp capable of of reaching the top of the pyramid, it would have to be like a mile long, and we would ha- it would involve more construction than the pyramid itself, and it, and we don't have any evidence of this. If they like built a big ramp in front of the Great Pyramid, we should it should leave traces that would still be visible today. And there's not. And so the single long ramp theory is not widely supported. One suggestion, it comes from the Greek tourist and historian Herodotus, who visited Egypt. And when he was there, he was told that they used machines to lift the blocks up. And the best theory running is that those machines were winches levers of some type they could use to they didn't have modern cranes but effectively the same principle you get a block up one level and then you 
winch it or lever it up to the next level and so forth. So they may have had a machine of some kind that did that. Another theory is that instead of having one long ramp, they had a ramp that kind of wound around the pyramid. And as it got higher, they could bring blocks up that ramp and then they tore down the ramp when they were done. A very interesting theory was proposed by a French architect, I believe, and he suggested that they made an internal ramp inside the pyramid. And so it, it's an, he proposes there's an open space that winds up inside the pyramid that they then covered up as they built progressively higher, and that's why we don't see it. But there is some evidence from thermal imaging of the pyramid from above that such an open space, uh, such a winding open space may exist. And the theory has enough support, or at least it has had enough support, that my man Bob Breyer, Egyptologist <laughs> and philosopher, did a whole book as well as a documentary about it. And the book is called The Secret of the Great Pyramid, and we'll have a link to that as well. Uh, listener Paul L. says, what do you think of the about the green children of Woolpit? Uh, Woolpit? <laughs> yeah, Wool, Woolpit is a place in England in Suffolk, if I recall correctly, and it's named because of the wolf pits that they had in the area to trap wolves. And in the 1100s, apparently around the year 1144, they found these children. There were two children, a boy and a girl. The girl was a little older, the boy a little younger. And they didn't speak any known language. And they were green. <laughs> and they had a weird diet. They didn't want to eat normal food. At first, they would only eat a certain kind of bean. That was the only thing that people had that they were willing to eat. Eventually, they got used to normal food and their green color went away. And they eventually, or at least the girl, eventually learned to speak English. The boy died. And when the girl learned to speak English, she said that they were from a place called St. Martin's Land, where everything was green. And in some versions of this story, I think St. Martin's Land is supposed to be located under underground. So there has been a question of, are these children from an underground civilization? Are they from an alien planet? Are they from a parallel world? And while I can't rule out those absolutely, it seems to me the most probable explanation, assuming this isn't just a legend, because the the first account of this was written 44 years after it happened, at least the first surviving account. And so it could just be a folktale. But if it's based on a real historical event, my guess is they were children that had been brought either from a place in Great Britain where they spoke a different language or maybe they were immigrants from the continent of Europe. They were kids. They got lost. They didn't speak the local language. They weren't used to this food. And they had a dietary or other medical condition that caused them to have what was known historically as chlorosis. And you can hear the relation to the word chlorophyll there, the stuff that makes plants green. Today, it's called hyperchronic anemia. And it does indeed give your skin a kind of greenish tint. It can be caused by things like a vitamin B6 deficiency. It can also be caused by other things. It's also possible that it might have been something other than hyperchronic anemia. For example, when people are suffering from uh, liver problems, they can become jaundiced, which causes the skin to take on a yellowish color. Also, you eat too many carrots and you can get beta carotene poisoning that will turn your skin orange. And so, so I would s suppose that based on what we know, if this is based on a historical event, the children most likely had a dietary problem, which explained the skin color and then why it went away. But it's a fascinating thing, and I uh, hope to talk about it on a future episode. Well, sure, in Bogoro, are we sure they weren't leprechauns from Ireland, you know? <laughs> Pretty sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then uh, Sean F. asks, uh, Hi, Jimmy, what do you make of the infamous Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot video footage? Has it ever been definitively proven to be a hoax? Bigfoot enthusiasts say that it has never been officially debunked, and that it is genuine Bigfoot video footage showing musculature and female breasts. However, I've also read that someone admitted that it was a hoax and a man in a costume. What do you think? So we talk about the Patterson-Gimlin film in episode three of the podcast, which was on Bigfoot. And 
there we discussed it a bit, including the fact that one guy did say I was the guy in the suit, and another guy said, and I made the suit. Patterson and Gimlin didn't say that, but some other people have claimed that. Now, you then have the question of, is there are their claims accurate, or are they the ones who are doing the hoaxing? So someone is obviously hoaxing in connection with this video. The question is, was it the people who made it, or at least one of the people who made it? Or was it was it these later guys trying to take credit for something? Obviously, there's no way to officially debunk the film because there's no official office of Bigfoots <laughs> in the U.S. government yet, but they'll apparently fund just about anything. So it's a matter of debate. And recently, I've come across some new information, and we may be talking specifically about the Patterson-Gimlin film in an upcoming episode. Teresa N. asks... Uh Jimmy on the on Jimmy Hoffa, the Jimmy Hoffa episode, you said he wasn't afraid of the mob because he had information on it that would be revealed when he died or if he was killed. Why didn't that deter the mob? And what happened to that information? Presumably when he died, you know, what happened? Yeah. So the episode where we talk about this is episode number 26. And we rely heavily in that episode on a book called I Heard You Paint Houses, which is based on the reminiscences of the man who claims to and very plausibly did kill Jimmy Hoffa. He said that, you know, Hoffa felt confident going forward that the mob would not do a hit on him because he had in case of my death information that would prove embarrassing to them. I would assume that the that Hoffa overestimated how what the mob would react, what the mob's reaction would be that they said, "Ah, he doesn't he doesn't know anything we can't weather." So even if it does get out, we'll weather the storm. And so I think that was a miscalculation on his part. In terms of what happened to the evidence, it might have been released through one channel or another and just got folded into the mob investigations that were going on at the time. And it was never specifically tied to his death that we're releasing this because of Jimmy Hoffa was hit. Uh, if you I mean, if you were someone that Jimmy Hoffa trusted and you had such information and wanted to turn it over to the FBI, you might not say I'm doing this because of Jimmy. You right. might just say, here's some information you might want to know about. On the other hand, having seen Jimmy Hoffa just whacked, if you had such information, you might want to keep your mouth shut lest they whack you, too. <laughs> right. So his his plans might have failed in that regard. And if the mob knew who had such information, they could have gone around to them and leaned on them to say, you better not start talking. Right. We weren't afraid of Jimmy talking. So we'll, you know, so obviously we're not afraid of taking taking you out. It's, 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 I suppose it's also possible it might have been a bluff and they called his bluff. It's possible. But given that he was behaving very recklessly, I think he probably did have info. I mean, we know he had information about the mob. And I think he probably did feel that he had enough that he could behave in this reckless way without getting whacked. So Larry S. now asks, uh, I've always been enthralled with the saints who could levitate and bilocate, such as Thomas Aquinas and Padre Pio. Are there any stories behind these events from eyewitnesses? Could they perform these miracles at will or only at certain times, such as during a static prayer? It's a very interesting subject, and I've tagged it for you for discussion in a future episode. I haven't thoroughly researched this subject yet. My understanding is that there were people who reported seeing such levitations. I don't know if we have firsthand accounts. That's something I'll have to do more research on. It's also my understanding that this is not something people could just do at will. It's not like Sister Bertrill and the Flying Nun. I think that that was a show when I was a kid. It was kind of <laughs> kind of popular. Yes. In any event, I I think these were exceptional, occasional things, and they didn't like just have the superpower of flight. Paul B asks uh, concerning your fasting episode: How many calories do you eat for your one meal, and how long does it take for you to eat it? Thank you. I I don't really keep track of calories in any rigorous way. What I notice is if I get below a certain threshold I tend to, of calories, I tend to lose weight. And I don't know exactly what that threshold is, but if my one meal is less than 1,500 calories, I, I tend to lose weight. And at least that's an approximation, but that's, my, that's, that's kind of my best guess. In terms of how long it takes me to eat that, 
I have a two hour eating window each day. So if on fasting days and like I don't fast on Sundays, but on fasting days and I also don't fast when I'm slacking off. But <laughs> on fasting days, I have a 22 hour fasting period and then a two hour eating window. Okay. And we talked about that topic on episode 21, the mystery of weight loss. Yes, and we'll probably be doing a future episode specifically about fasting, which has more benefits than just weight loss. Kevin K says, uh, he asks, what do you think about the uh, Polybius arcade machine that was supposedly made by the government for testing on children? Is it just an urban legend? Well, it's really tricky. So the claim is that back, I think it was 1981, there was an arcade game that appeared called Polybius, apparently named after the Greek historian of the same name. And this game was very addictive. People loved playing it. They they just really got into it. Long lines formed in front of the Polybius machines. And guys in suits were seen doing stuff with the machines that was then interpreted as this is the men in black downloading information out of these machines. And the theory was that they were doing some kind of psychological experiment on people, maybe having to do with addictiveness. Also, it was reported that some of the some of the people who played these games later suffered ill effects like nightmares or seizures or things like that. And then very quickly, the machines all disappeared, like in a month or something. And there this this is a subject of controversy in the gaming community. We don't have any physical machines of this nature. We have people who claim to have parts of the programming that was used for Polybius. We also have a guy who said, I was one of the designers and it got pulled because a kid happened, had an epileptic seizure. In terms of did it exist, I don't know. But it's not implausible that in 1981, the government and specifically the CIA would be doing experiments of this nature because up into the 1970s, they had a project going known as MK Ultra, which we will definitely be talking about on a future episode. And one of the things that MK Ultra researched was mind control and this kind of addiction and can you induce psychological effects in people is something the CIA would be interested in and had been interested in. And so the story is not itself implausible. It's just a question of verifiability. Uh, then Jimmy C. asks, is there any truth to the claim that lucid dreaming can be induced? How should we as Catholics approach the phenomenon? So lucid dreaming is a state of, of sleep where you are dreaming and you're aware of the fact that you're dreaming. That's why it's called lucid. And sometimes if you're, if you're dreaming lucidly, you can even influence the course of the dream and say, oh, I don't want that to happen. I want this to happen instead. Lucid dreaming is a real phenomenon. I experience it myself. Uh, I, In fact, I experience it somewhat frequently. My problem is that when I do become aware of the fact that I'm dreaming, I usually wake up, especially if I try to force the dream in a new direction, I wake up. And so some people have proposed using lucid dreaming to achieve psychic abilities like travel out of your body and stuff that I'm very skeptical of. I'm also uh, it also is going to conflict with Catholic moral theology. At least there's a strong likelihood of it doing so. But there are other potential applications for it. Like, let's say you have nightmares. Let's say you have a lot of nightmares and it's messing with you during the day. Well, that's a situation where you might want to say, can I learn to lucid dream? And can I then learn to affect the course of the dream so it ceases to be a nightmare and I'll stop having to carry around the way these nightmares are messing with me, maybe like get better sleep. And so in that situation, trying to learn to lucid dream or just learning to have fun in your dreams, you know, it could be potentially morally legitimate. Can you learn to do it? I don't know of any studies on this, but my sense is probably. Because a lot of what's a lot of what happens with our dreams can be learned. I, you know, most people don't remember their dreams, 
but it is possible to teach yourself to remember them. And one of the keys to that is keeping a dream diary so that as soon as you wake up, you jot down a sketch of what was in your dream and you do that enough, you start, it, it, your brain learns to retain that information. It seems that we're programmed to forget our dreams, that there's some mechanism in our brain that causes us to forget. Presumably, that's an evolutionary adaptation to keep our memories from being filled with unreal phantasmagoria that could be potentially confusing if we remembered it the way we remember real life. And so we're programmed to forget it, but it does seem that training can impact that to where you can remember more of your dreams. I've done that. When I was in my teenage years, I kept a dream diary and I could then remember a lot more of my dreams. And today I don't do that. But if, when I do wake up, I if I think about it real quick and in repeat what happened in the dream and my waking memory, then I can retain it. And so also when I was a kid, and I haven't tried doing this lately, but when I was a kid, I would have the ability to say, I want to wake up at 8 a.m. or some other time. And then I would, even without an alarm clock. And so I think it's possible to train a bunch of these things. And I think it's consequently probable that you could train yourself to do lucid dreaming. I often wake up if I have a like a flight I have to catch or something like that. And I know I've got to be up by 4.30. I've got to be up by 4.30. Yeah. And I wake up just before the alarm. So that's the same kind of thing. When I was a kid, we'd be going on trips. And we need to leave at a certain time in the morning. And so I'd program myself to wake up then. I do remember my dream last night. I dreamed I encountered Benedict Cumberbatch at the dairy case at the grocery store. Interesting. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure I want to know, but that's okay. Well, we have a question <laughs> coming up about what dreams mean. I, I don't remember what I dreamed last night, but I do remember recently I dreamed that there was a giant monarch butterfly that was on the floor in my living room. And it had a wing spread of about two feet. And it it was looking out my front door and just sitting there and it kind of gently flapped its wings back and forth. And then it got bored with looking out the front door and it instead climbed up on something. And that was the last I saw of it. But I thought, wow, that's a really pretty giant monarch butterfly. <laughs> Dream interpretation. That that would be an interesting discussion because I've got some weird ones. So, mm -hmm. but let's move on uh, in this episode uh, to the next question. Kathy S. Uh, ask, says, the above all sound great, referring to all the previous questions. Green children could go with the Casper Hauser mystery, Genie the Wild Child, etc. Also, the moving coffins of Barbados and the quantum enigma. Also, whale languages and dolphins saving humans from drowning. Yeah, and kangaroos saving humans from getting their heads hit. That's happened, too. There was a case in Australia where a guy got hit in the head and collapsed and the kangaroo went to fetch help. So there's a lot of interesting topics. I appreciate those, Kathy. Unfortunately, I can't really there's so much there. I can't really comment on them now, but I have scheduled each of those uh, six topics as potential future episodes. So hope to get back to those. Uh, Nick R. asks, Jimmy, do you think time travel is a cop-out for ending a Star Trek series? For example, Star Trek Voyager. I hate that ending. <laughs> That's a very topical question, by the way. We were, yeah. We're not going to spoil anything, but it is topical. <laughs> yeah. Also, we have this Secrets of Star Trek podcast you might want to check out. That's right. So this is, this is more of a personal opinion question. I don't mind time travel in principle. In fact, I actually like time travel stories. It's a question of how they're executed. Larry Niven, the uh, famous science fiction writer, who who I whose stuff I like, he's a, he's a, I, his was some of the earliest science fiction I read growing up, and I still read it. Larry Niven has an essay on time travel that's very interesting. He also has, and I don't know if he still feels this way, but I know in the past he's gone on record as not liking time travel stories on the premise that you can just have anything happen in them. And so if you can go back and change history, then it undermines dramatic tension. And personally, I don't buy that because it's fiction. And in fiction, you can have anything happen. <laughs> right. and, and that will kill dramatic tension. I mean, if you have a story that consists of the fluffy bunny hopped over here and the fluffy bunny hopped over there and the fluffy bunny was happy. There's no real dramatic tension there. So you need to create dramatic tension. You need rules. And most fiction, all good fiction, operates under rules that the audience implicitly understands or has explained to them. 
so that they know what's possible and not possible within this rules framework. And the rules or limitations on what people can do then creates the dramatic tension. So I don't mind time travel in principle on the ground that anything can happen because that's just fiction. The question is, what are the rules? How clearly are they spelled out? How clearly are they followed? And do they create dramatic tension leading to a satisfying payoff when the tension is resolved? And so to me, I don't mind time travel stories, and I don't mind ending seasons or series of Star Trek with them in principle. It's just a question of how well are they executed. And indeed, there is a good bit to criticize about the ending of Star Trek Voyager, including the finale. Uh, which you could hear us talk about eventually on <laughs> The Secrets of Star Trek on the StarQuest Network. Uh, let's see. Joe T says uh, or asks, did Hitler really die when they say he did or did he escape? This is one of those things that uh, a lot of people today would just instantly scoff and say, oh, of course, Hitler's dead. Well, he's definitely dead at this point because he would be over a century old. But the uh, you would also have this kind of reflex of, oh, of course, he died on April 30th, 1944, like the standard account says. But the thing is. There's more to this than a lot of people are aware. I don't have a conclusion at this point. I assume the standard account is correct, that he did die on April 30th, 1945, by shooting himself in the Fuhrer bunker. But I also know that there's, there's some reason to suspect that, because in July, I want to say it's either June or July of 1945, the Soviets said he escaped. Even Joseph Stalin said he escaped. Now, the counter to that is going to be, well, this is disinformation on their part. Okay, why? What is the reason for the disinformation? But I also know the FBI and the CIA took sightings of Hitler seriously in the 1940s and 50s. They got a bunch of reported Hitler sightings, and they investigated them. The claim, then, is that Hitler went somewhere, maybe Argentina. That's the most common theory, because a lot of Nazi war criminals did go to Argentina. It's not the only one. I know of one book that proposes he actually went to Indonesia, even further afield, in uh, very recently. So, you know, we had some remains of Hitler, or what was claimed to be Hitler, and an autopsy had been done, but because Hitler had lookalikes, they're not, you know, the argument would be, well, maybe this was one of Hitler's body doubles. Well, so in terms of the remains we currently have, we have part of a skull that shows bullet wound to, I think it's the left temple area, and we also have a jawbone. And these are in the possession of the Soviets. And they did DNA testing. Now, they said the jawbone matches Hitler's dental records. So if that's true, it's either someone with a mouth identical to Hitler's or it's Hitler's. But the skull fragment, they did DNA testing on it, I think in 2009. And it turned out to be based on the, the way the skull bones join together. You can tell a person's age. And that, with the DNA testing, revealed that it was the skull of a woman who was under 40 years of age. Mm. So wrong sex and wrong age and not Hitler. And, th and so, to my mind, that raises a question, well, what did the DNA of the jawbone say? And that test, so far as I know, has not been run, but it's the one that needs to be run to try to resolve this. And believe me, we're definitely going to be talking about did Hitler escape in a future episode. The boys, the movie, uh, 1970 movie, The Boys from Brazil was about Hitler clones. So not quite the yep. same thing. Yeah. Okay. Not quite the same thing. <laughs> All right. Just put me in mind of that. Victor L uh, uh, says, one of the joys of the show is discovering incredibly weird things that I didn't even know I was interested in. But here's a more general question. How credible do you find paranormal investigators, generally speaking? You'd think real scientists, air quotes, real scientists would be interested in figuring out what ghosts are. So why does answering that question always seem to be left to some guys from Rhode Island with a night vision cam video camera instead of someone at MIT? Um, so I would say that in general, I am quite skeptical of most paranormal investigators. Uh, most paranormal investigators, as Victor indicates, are amateurs. They're not really trained or credentialed. They have a lot of self-training, but they don't have a good background in science and a, a mind for thinking of 
what what natural could explain this. They tend to to be more credulous of claims than than I think they ought to be. I think some of them are outright hoaxers who are who are doing it for personal benefit. Bottom line is I'm skeptical of most paranormal investigators, not necessarily all. Uh, there are people who have good credentials, who have good backgrounds, who display the right balance of openness and critical thinking. And so I have, you know, respect for them. But most, I, I, anything I hear from a paranormal investigator, my initial reaction is to be skeptical of it. In terms of why real scientists don't investigate these things, it's because of the giggle factor. They know that if they do investigate these things, and a lot of them, a lot of them are themselves naturalists uh, of a materialistic nature. So they don't believe in the supernatural anyway. So that kind is not going to be interested in openly investigating these claims. They're going to be interested, if anything, in debunking them or not giving them any more attention because they think it's an embarrassment. But because those uh, scientists who might be open know that their colleagues would laugh at them and it would harm their careers, that's one reason they don't investigate. They also know that the funding agencies that supply the funds needed to do scientific research would also laugh at this stuff, and they would not get funding even if they applied for grants. In fact, even just applying for a grant to research ghosts could harm their reputations. This is something we see in other fields. Uh, there's a book I have by Stephen Hawking where he admits that scientists researching time travel don't call it time travel in their grant applications. They say they want to investigate closed time-like curves <laughs> because they, if they said time travel, it would get laughed at and they wouldn't get the funding thereafter. And so I think that applies in an even bigger way to, uh, to ghosts. You'd have to find some really convoluted, non-obvious synonym for ghosts if you wanted to write a grant and get it successfully funded. Yeah, it reminds me of the uh, scientist, the very well-known and well-respected uh, phys astrophysicist or astronomer who uh, was talking about, had a theory about the Oumuamua uh, mm -hmm. object the, uh, yeah. uh, going through our solar system. He suggested it might be an alien probe. And that has, it was, there was actually an article in the Boston Globe recently because he's based here in, in Boston, I think at Harvard. It's talking about how just his suggestion that it might be an alien space probe has resulted not only in people kind of mock his field, but other people who work in his department also get it wanting to distance himself a little. So uh, it's very yeah. interesting how, th how that works, uh, yeah. th th these, these areas uh, for scientists. Yeah. As one book I have, which is actually a quite a good book called 13 Things That Don't Make Sense, in science fashion matters. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, if you want to hear more about Ghosts, Victor, check out episode one of the podcast. We did that on Ghosts, and we will definitely be talking about Ghosts in future episodes. All right. Any, Ernie M. says, uh, is it covering dream interpreters? I understand this is prevalent in scripture and have found it fascinating. I've had personal experiences with dreams concerning lost relatives. Others around me have mentioned this as well. I'm curious how some figures seem to make careers out of interpreting these dreams, and has it fallen victim or transitioned to the New Age movement? Well, I definitely have had an episode on dreaming, on, and it, which would include dream interpretation, on the, on the list of future ideas. We'll definitely be doing an episode about that. It's an interesting subject. Obviously, God does sometimes use dreams to communicate with people. That's something that is in Scripture. On the other hand, most dreams are meaningless. Most dreams are just our brains processing information based on daily experience and our imagination. And there are some interesting scientific theories about exactly what our brains are doing when we dream. This is actually one of those scientific mysteries we do not fully understand. And I think it's in 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. But we will be talking about it. And I myself have had a dream. This was when I was a teenager. I had a dream that predicted the future in astonishing detail, and I told a friend about the dream before it was fulfilled, and then he was standing there when it was fulfilled, and his jaw just dropped open. Hmm. And so I'll, we'll talk about that in the episode on dreaming. I'll give you the details on that in the future. Okay. Les R. asks, climate change, is it as dire a problem as we hear? And if so, what options do we have left that might be successful, and at what cost? 
Well, I've already got an episode planned for the future specifically about climate change or global warming. This is one that's in my gray basket. I don't know whether the Earth is warming or not. If it is warming, I don't know if mankind is significantly responsible for that or not. I do know that the science in this area is highly politicized and that people who have made global warming claims are prone sometimes to making predictions that have turned out to be false, and they have also been caught manipulating data. And so I think we have to proceed with caution here. I'm I'm not, on the other hand, I'm not sold that there's nothing to this, that I'm not sold that the earth is definitely not warming or that mankind is definitely not responsible. So this is in my gray basket. I, I think we need to proceed cautiously and with healthy skepticism towards both the definite yes and definite no positions. I, I, I think, unfortunately, in science, fashion matters. And right now, the fashion is to be very pro-global warming. But fashion and evidence aren't the same things. Yeah. And then when you mix politics into the into the whole thing, it gets even worse. So Even worse. <laughs> it's all right. Mark C. says, uh, Jimmy, my wife and I listen to each and every... I'm sorry. My wife and I listen each and every day to your many ventures on radio and podcasts. Here's the mystery. Balthazar of Alexandria is portrayed as a protagonist in the Lou Wallace novel Ben-Hur, and the movie's based upon the novel. A little bit of truth. How did pen and paper devise such great characters in Ben-Hur when it seems it must be real or true? Is there a possibility that Balthazar could have sought Jesus out when Jesus began his ministry? Thank you for tackling this. Uh, and it says, parenthetically, are you fond of the Ben-Hur storyline? It's been a long time since I've seen Ben-Hur, and recently I downloaded the novel to listen to it, but I haven't gotten through it yet. But I am intrigued by the story. In terms of the of Balthazar, so for people who may not be aware, that's the name that is traditionally given to one of the three magi, or three wise men. And so there is at least a little bit of truth in this, that there's a kernel of truth in that Magi did come to visit Jesus at his uh, birth, or actually when he was about two years old. And so that that much is true. However, he probably was not from Alexandria. The Magi were originally a class of Persian priests, and so he would have come from Persia, not Alexandria in Egypt. Or if not Persia, he would have come from another land to the east of Israel, uh, because there, that's the term Magi had come to be applied to some other groups as well in that area. But it, the odds of him having come from Alexandria would be very low. It's not impossible that he could have gone back if he was still alive 30 years later when Jesus was having his adult ministry. It's not impossible but it's also not especially probable. So I think that however entertaining and interesting the Ben-Hur story is, either in its literary or cinem cinematic form may be, there's a kernel of truth about Balthazar, but not much more than a kernel as he's portrayed there. Mm. To the credit of Lou Wallace, who created the character that seems so real. Yeah. Rick A. says, uh, without a doubt, my favorite mystery is the Shroud of Turin. It is either the actual burial shroud of Jesus Christ and the image as a result of the power of the resurrection, or it's the greatest hoax of all time. Some claim that it's a forgery from the Middle Ages, yet how could an ancient artist possibly create something so complex that it defies the scrutiny of modern science? I've had the privilege to be in the presence of the shroud in the chapel in Turin. It was not visible, but was covered up in a protective glass enclosure, and the experience was one of the most profound spiritual events of my life. As I contemplated the possible reality of the shroud, I was simply overwhelmed. So I'd love to hear your spin on both sides of the topic, reason versus faith. I appreciate that. We've had a lot of people request episodes on the Shroud of Turin, and I've had it on the list for a long time. I don't know when we'll do it because I need to do more research on this. And the and not just, I always do research for upcoming episodes, but there's a lot here that I need to research. The arguments on this question are not simple. There are multiple claims and counterclaims across multiple different fields. I mean, textile studies and pollen studies and blood type studies and image studies and 
all kinds of different areas. And some of them are very technical and very scientific, and you have competing experts claiming different things. And I'm not an expert in any of those fields. My expertise is in apologetics. And some apologists, including some in the, in the Protestant world, I think Gary Habermas is an example, are very big proponents of the Shroud of Turin and will use it in their apologetics and say, this is evidence that Jesus really rose from the dead and thus that the Christian faith is true. I would love to make that argument, but I can't because, I mean, I, I, I'm not stopping anybody from doing it, but I personally don't feel I can for two reasons. One, I haven't gone through all of the very detailed arguments uh, on both sides and established that the evidence clearly favors one side over the other. And two, there was the carbon dating that they did a number of decades ago that said this is from the Middle Ages. And I know there are re rejoinders to that where people have said, well, you tested the wrong part of it, or there's this process that interfered with the carbon dating. And here's all this wonderful other evidence that supports it being from the first century. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. The problem apologetically is that as long as the consensus in the scientific community is that carbon dating shows it's medieval, then that shifts an apologetic discussion to a question just about the carbon dating. And because if the carbon dating is accurate, then it can't be from the time of Jesus. And so rather than spin my wheels arguing perhaps unsuccessfully about carbon dating, I would prefer to move on to present other more solid evidence for the Christian faith that doesn't have a scientific consensus saying this is impossible. And so this is another one that's kind of in my gray basket, it, certainly in terms of its apologetic usefulness, which is the field that I really know. Uh, in terms of spirituality, though, it is very moving, and people have genuine exper spiritual experiences coming in contact with it, just like they do with other devotional objects like icons. And in fact, if you look at the way the recent popes have talked about the Shroud, in, including John Paul II and Benedict XVI, uh, John Paul II said the church doesn't have a position on its authenticity. It leaves that up to scientists to try to determine. But the church does use it as an icon that has profound spiritual significance that can teach us and help us grow closer to God. And Benedict XVI has said the same thing. So the church respects the shroud. It leaves the question of the shroud's authenticity open, but it recognizes the spiritual value of the shroud and how God can use the shroud to bring us closer to him and enrich our spiritual lives. All right. And then Joel L. asks, uh, Jimmy, can you please elaborate on the mysterious relics of Christ, such as the crown of thorns, the spear of destiny, the holy nails, and the holy grail? Which of these relics have the best claim to being authentic, and which ones are most likely imposters? It's another fascinating question. It's also one that I need to research more. I've done a little bit of research into this area, but not enough to present conclusions. I appreciate the way Joel asked the question in terms of, you know, which of these have the best claims and, and which are probably not authentic. There's a tendency on the one hand to either, that some folks have, to either dismiss everything or accept everything. And the truth is usually in the middle. When I went uh, to Israel for the first time, I, you know, was moved by places where certain biblical events are commemorated. Like if you go to the Sea of Galilee, there's a place that it's got a little kind of pavilion where Jesus's teachings by the Sea of Galilee are commemorated. But we don't know that he literally stood on this spot. I found that moving. But what really engaged me was were the sites where we know for a fact it was right here. And so I whenever I approach something spiritual, whether it's a, a place or an artifact, a relic like this, I try to do that sorting in terms of, OK, however meaningful and we can e use even, you know, images of things that obviously are not the authentic thing. We can use images of these things as a form of spiritual enrichment. But there's still that question of, is it one of the authentic ones and how do we know? And that really is something I am interested in. And I continue to study this area. I already had the Spear of Destiny and the Holy Grail on the list of future shows. 
And I've added uh, Crown of Thorns and Holy Nails for uh, possible use in a future episode as well. So, Jimmy, we've talked about the length of time that we had looked at. There are a few other patron questions. The second we've answered all of the uh, patrons, at least one of their questions. There's a few yep. second questions left, but we we'll look, maybe we could save them for a future uh, revisiting of this topic or? Yeah, well, uh, we had a final comment from Kathy S who says, by the way, very happy we're getting a bonus broadcast. Wish we could have it every month. And the good news is, well, I don't know that we'll have it every month, but we are planning to do this again. And so we uh, want to continue to thank our patrons. Uh, we wanted to, before committing to doing this on a regular basis, we wanted to see what the reaction from the patrons was. Would they provide enough questions to do a show like this. And they did. We even have a few questions left over. I'm glad we were able to get to at least one question from everybody today, but we'll save the rest. And on the principle of first come, first serve, if you didn't have your second question answered today, it will be at the top of our next patrons question show. And so we want to thank everybody, and we'll be doing this again in the future on a regular basis. And uh, we'll put a post in our page, on our Patreon page when it's time to submit more questions and all that sort of thing. So uh, be yeah. looking for that. So, Jimmy, what further resources do we have for today's show on all of this uh, stuff we've talked about so much? Yeah, well, um, I was able to, to provide links to things for many of the questions that people asked about. We'll have links to... Wikipedia's articles on long-delayed echoes and Bracewell probes will also have the original link that the listener sent in about the Epsilon Booties long-delay echo Bracewell probe theory. We'll also have Wikipedia on pyramid construction theories, as well as Bob Breyer's book, The Secret of the Great Pyramid. We'll have articles on the ch green children of Woolpit, as well as chlorosis or hyperchronic anemia. We'll have study of the Patterson-Gimlin film, as well as a stabilized version of the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film. We'll have Charles Brandt's book on, on Jimmy Hoffa's death, I Heard You Paint Houses. We'll have an article on levitation. We'll have a link to Jason Fung and Jimmy Moore's book, The Complete Guide to Fasting. Also, the Polybius Arcade Game, Lucid Dreaming, Adolf Hitler's death and the conspiracy theories around it. Concerning global warming, we'll have a link to an article on the hockey stick controversy. That's the famous graph that allegedly shows temperatures spiking. We'll have links on the Shroud of Turin and other relics associated with Jesus. And uh, and so those are some additional resources. Also, I think we'll throw in 13 things that don't make sense. So you can check that book out, too. So that's it on this episode, then. Thank you again to all of our patrons and especially those who submitted questions for Jimmy to answer today. Uh, you could submit feedback. You could put put it on our uh, page at patreon.com slash StarQuest. Or you could, once it's uh, online and available to all our listeners, you could go to sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave feedback in those places. You can always send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. That's for everyone, patrons and, and uh, regular listeners alike. You can send a tweet to at mys underscore world or use the hashtag of hashtag mysterious feedback, all one word, no spaces in there. Remember to like and share the this episode on the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page once we post it there and uh, retweet it on Twitter when we post it there as well. That helps us to grow this audience. We're really always looking to reach more people with this great content and Jimmy's <laughs> vast store of knowledge. I think uh, we're we're actually making a difference in the world by sharing this sort of discussion and a very systematic and logical approach to all of these mysteries. So you can help us in that by letting others know about the podcast and about these episodes. Uh, like, like Jimmy said, you can find links to the resources from today's show on our show notes, uh, which we'll be first posting at patreon.com slash StarQuest, and eventually when we release the show to all the listeners at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to and supporting Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. So we hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. And if you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and perhaps have your question answered on a future show for patrons, 
you can go to sqpn.com slash give and become one of our patrons. Thank you very much.